You want modules, not microservices. For those that are watching this on YouTube, if you're wondering why chats like this, well, hey, guess what? Some bad things happened and OBS doesn't work right now. Dissecting why everybody keeps talking about microservices. Okay, here we go. TLDR, architecture is hard sometimes. People keep offering up some new idea that quickly becomes the mainstream way of doing it without any context or nuance. And the industry desperate, let's see, desperate to find ways to improve their architecture snaps it up without hesitation. Microservices was the latest in the trend and it's time we dissect the idea and got the real root of what's going on. Okay. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm excited. At the heart of microservices, we're told we'll find lots of good things. Dude, okay, if you're gonna do this, at least just put the trademark symbol. It's so much better when you do that. Scalability, code can be broken into smaller parts that can be developed, tested, and deployed, uh, and updated independently. Yes, in some sense, this is very true. Some things become less true as time goes on. Uh, focus, developer focuses on solving business problems and business logic. Absolutely, business problems, business logic. It's not like you have to do discovery or health checks or an entire canary process or understanding when parts of your back end are failing or just this distributed craziness that does take place at some point in life. It do, you don't have to worry about any of that. Back end data must always be available for a wide range of devices. Okay. Simplicity provides a simplified development on large scaled enterprise applications. Okay. Responsiveness enables distributed applications to scale uh, is response to changing uh, transaction loads. Are supposed to be in response. Yes. Okay. Re uh, reliability ensures no single point of failure by providing replicated server groups that can continue when something breaks, restoring the r running application to good condition after failure occurs. Okay. I mean, these are all good things. I think, can, can we all agree we want all of this, right? Like if I could just focus on writing business logic, right? Like doing the thing I want to do, it would be great because you know what 90% of my job is, is not doing my job. 90% of my job is just like just solving the most asinine stuff ever. That's all it is. Somebody comes up with a clever new data format. Guess who's figuring that out? Hey, somebody reported some things in microseconds, nanoseconds, UTC date ints, and of course milliseconds, and then even some of them seconds. Well, guess whose job it is to figure out which of the many rainbow time flavors that you've just provided me and normalizing it to an actual time. Guess whose job that is? Guess whose job that is? You know how annoying it is to try to figure out what time you're in? You know how annoying that is? Oh, you provided me seconds? My, um, milliseconds, microseconds, um, uh, nanoseconds, or uh, UTC data. Dude, I actually have a function that goes through all of this and tries to guess which one you are. It is absurd. Prime got some trauma there. I got some trauma, boys. <laughs> Dude, and the worst part is, is my date int, I kid you not. My date int looks like this. My my date int checker is literally uh, like a uh, function is UTC uh, date, right? Let's just pretend this is it. Uh, oh, whoa, whoa. How did I get here? How did I get to the change me daddy? Uh, let's go like this. Uh, date, which is just a number, right? I literally go like this. Uh, date is greater than or equal to uh, 2003. And, and uh, date is less than uh, or less than or equal to 3000. And just be like, you know, future me, future me is going to have to figure this shit out when things go wrong. You know what I mean? There we go. Right? Future me is going to have to figure out when something's gone wrong. Right? Like, that's me. Because you know what? I'm so, because luckily I'm only working on things that have date stamps and, uh, in uh, 2023 and later. So it's just like, whatever, <laughs> future me, right? And then some of my, I realized that some of my places, I kid you not, had this. Uh, it had 20, uh, 20, uh, uh, I literally left this comment at some point that said, uh, future me will uh, be mad, but present me is very happy. <laughs> like, I left that comment for myself. Just so I will know that I already know this is a hack, right? Like, I already know it's a hack. We all know it's a hack. Ain't no, ain't no way we're thinking that we're, we're making some amazing tool here, right? Like, you got to know the bounds of your tool. My tool should not exist for another year, right? If it still exists within a year, I think, I honestly think Netflix done f up, right? It's a hack from the start. You got to know your stuff. Tech society. It just hurts. It always hurts. All right. These all sound relatively familiar. I'm not imagine, but the fun part about those six quotes is that the two were taken from microservices, literature, blog posts, papers, etc. 
Wait, what? Uh, and two from 20 years ago, EJB Literature. I don't know what EJB is. I feel like I should. And two from Oracle Tuxedo, which is 40 plus years techno uh, ago technology. Can you spot uh, which went to which? I don't know. Uh, we have a tendency in the industry to reuse our hype points over and over again. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. George Santanyana. Life of Reason, 1905. Uh, EJB equals trash. Oh, okay, that's trash dev. I didn't realize trash dev was that. With respect to the microservices hype, one company's blog post offers 10 reasons uh, to charge into microservices. I bet you this might be Netflix. <laughs> How much do you want to bet this might actually be Netflix? Hold on. I got to do this. I, I, I got to do this. Hold on. There we go. This just makes life so much easier because I can go like this. All right. One, they promote big data best practices. Microservices naturally fit within a data pipeline oriented architecture, which aligns with the way big data should be collected, ingested, processed, and delivered. Each step in the data pipeline handles one small task in the form of a micro service. They are relative. Number two, they are relatively easy to build and maintain. In some sense, I do think this point is correct is that they are easy to build or maintain if what you're building is a really small server, right? Simple servers are obviously simple to maintain. It's a very isolated look to think that though. That's the problem. Uh, their single purpose design means, oh man, I... Okay, I do. I mean, I want to look at those things. I like this. All right. Anyways, they are relatively easy to build and maintain. Their single purpose design means that. Oh, yeah, we already. We, oh, wait. No, I didn't read that. There's, <laughs> they're relatively easy to build and maintain. Their single purpose design means they can be built and maintained by smaller teams. Each team can focus cross functional while also specialized in a subset of microservice solutions. Like, all this sounds great, right? They enable higher quality code. Modularizing an overall solution into discrete components helps application development teams focus on one small part at a time. This simplifies the overall all coding and testing process sure they simplifies cross-team coordination this one I'm, I'm i'm more in doubt of though i do agree but i'm in doubt what i mean by that is that right away without even looking at this there always comes this problem where you have a change right you have a change in api what do you do well you kind of have to maintain an old endpoint and you have to have the new endpoint, and then you have to go to all the other teams and then make sure that they do the right thing. And then if you're also including mobile applications, mobile applications can also end up having these like stale versions in which now you have to support this old path for the life of your application until you force like an upgrade or an end of life. Like it's not as simple as people make it because it always ends up being really, really hard, right? People, there's just this concept that things are just super simple and they're not. Microservices are a great idea if you have a stable full of high quality developers <laughs> and have written a version one previously that con uh, concretely identifies your real requirements and weaknesses. And the only way it ever works is if you can replace one component at a time. This is actually a really great take. It's this, I mean, for me, it's the same argument why you'd use Rust, which is until you know your landscape truly, uh, this is why I've come around to go. I finally have come around to go. I know. I know. Shocker. But until you know your landscape, use something that's really good for it. You have the best titles, dude. I don't have the best titles. I take my titles from this. The gopher wins. The gopher wins. I know. Shut up. All right. They enable real-time process. Oh, Paul, let me read this one. Unlike traditional service-oriented architecture, uh, Cool. Uh, which typically involves heavyweight inter-process communication protocols. By the way, if you're using inter-process communication protocols, you're almost always incorrect. I think that moving your database off, off box, awesome. Moving your message queue off box, awesome. Right? Like there's plenty of things that are awesome to do. Right? Don't kill the gophers. I'm not going to. Microservices use event streaming technologies that make it. No, see, I don't even believe this. Right? You can still do both these things at the same time. Anyways, keep on going. They enable real-time processing. At the core of microservices architecture is a publish or a pub sub uh, framework enabling data process in real time to deliver immediate output and insights. This part is also one of those really hard things that people talk about a lot, which is it's true. There's a lot of benefits to microservices, but to trace a singular request through a large mature system is really hard, right? To understand exactly what happened is non-trivial. Once you go back, I mean, like, if you have three services, yeah, you can just, like, you can do it, you know? 
You can just kind of grep your way through logs and figure it out. You can have like an X ID, some sort of request ID that passes through all the headers. You can totally do that. But it's not necessarily that simple. Observability is a key. Observability is a key, and it becomes excessively hard when you have 800 services called for a single request, right? Like there are requests like that at Netflix that literally call hundreds of services or a series of requests, right? You, you, you call, you get some sort of data, comes to the client, the client makes some decisions based on say AB test allocation, all this stuff. So you have this like N plus one problem of requesting that can take place and it's just like super hard. There's a lot of stuff that's really hard. They facilitate rapid growth. Microservices, they do facilitate rapid growth. Truer statements have never been said. Microservices enable code and data reuse. Uh, the modular app, uh, architecture make it easier to deploy more data-driven use cases and solutions for added business value. Um, they enable more outputs. Data sets are often presented in different ways to different audiences. Microservices simplify or simp uh, yeah, simplify the way data can be extracted for various users. Easier to access updates in the application lifecycle. Advanced analytic environments, including those for uh, machine learning, need ways to access existing computation models against newly created models. AB and multivariant testing in microservice architecture enable users to validate their updated models. This was really complicated way to say canaries are great. They enable scale. Scalability. They actually, I'm not sure if they do truly do enable scale as much as they enable I mean, they scale the amount of internal requests you do make. Uh, I'm not sure if it's true that they enable scale, right? I'm not convinced on this one. Scalability is about uh, is about more than the ability to handle more volume. It's about the effort involved. Microservices make it easier to identify scaling bottlenecks and then resolve those bottlenecks uh, at a per microservice level. That's the problem is you also introduce a scaling issue of making all the requests, right? You 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 introduce a whole nother level, and those can also be difficult. Many popular tools are available. A variety of technologies in the big data world, including in the open source community, work well in microservice architectures. Uh, Apache, Hadoop, uh, Apache Spark, uh, no squeal databases. And many uh, streaming analytics tools can be used in microservices. We're also proud partner with the Pivotal in this area. So one thing that they're not talking about here, just even at this one, is that say you have three services. Say you had a singular function or a, a set of just, you know, a library that did something that went, grabbed your data, and made three separate calls and merged it all together and gave it to you. Now it's a microservice. So now you make three different HTTP re requests to three different servers, and it's all microserviced out. That is going to be a bottleneck of whichever one is slowest. Now, here comes the worst part is if you ever have to break it up, you may be able to do something clever where one thing is a monolith and is able to take the state of all this and make it into a singular request, whereas there's times you can't do that when you don't have a monolith. Very easy example. Say you want ratings. Ratings on a movie in Netflix is both what the user, what we think the user will like, plus whether they've liked it or stuff like that, right? Machine learning. So now you have this idea where you have to go and you have to go get videos, then you have to come back, and then you have to go and get ratings, right? Whereas if you're in more of a monolith world, you can go get video ratings, right? Video and ratings, same time. But now since it's a very microservice architect, like new bottlenecks do show up. And it's this idea that it's for freezy. It's not necessarily for freezy, you know? It's not necessarily for freezy. Uh, all in uh, all that being said, the idea of a really well-designed Go monolith app deployed as a striped binary, a stripped binary on a Docker scratch image being an app service uh, overlord is kind of sexy in a dis uh, disturbing but totally non-furry way. Reasonable. I mean, I do like microservices. Don't get me wrong. I like the idea. I think there's a lot of great things about it. Uh, really, if you think about it, your editor has become microservices. LSPs are a version of microservices. Was Jonathan Blow correct on saying LSPs are a sign of the times that we have become bad programmers? He actually might be right. Maybe it should have just been a library. Maybe it should have just been this way. Would it have been easier? I don't know if the updating and integration cycle would have been as easy, but if we have a well-defined protocol, it might have been better, right? I'm not saying which one's better. I, I just don't know. Right? I don't know. Many popular tools are available. A variety of technologies in the big world. Okay, yeah, we already read this. Let's take a second uh, and examine each of those. By this time, in light of prior art, uh, they promote uh, big data best practices. Pipe, uh, pipes and filter architectures have been a part of software since the 70s when Unix has promoted several ideas. Make each program do one thing well. Love this, by the way. Uh, to do a new job, build a fresh rather than a complicated old programs by adding features. I love this. By the way, this is like my favorite of all of the Unixisms, this is it. This is like my favorite thing that it, ever. This has been on my mind, constantly driven into it, because all I do is think about this when I make 
uh, CLI tools these days, which is like, how do you not, how do you avoid the, like, how do you avoid FFmpeg in some sense? FFmpeg is its own problem. I understand why it exists. It's extremely complicated. Same thing with like GStreamer, right? Very, very complicated. Yeah, ha- it's by its very nature, it has to be complicated. But if you don't have to be FFmpeg or GStreamer, how do you break your program into like three programs, right? Uh, expect the output of every program to become the input of another as yet unknown program. Don't clutter output with extraneous information. Avoid a string, uh, stringently columnar or binary input uh, formats. Uh, don't insist on interactive input. I love, I love all these things. What's the deal with the FFmpeg? Uh, they are relatively easy to, uh, to build and maintain. See the Unix philosophy above. Yep. Uh, they enable higher quality code. If focus on one small part at a time helps improve quality, then see the Linux f- philosophy above. <laughs> they simplify cross-team coordination. This one is interesting. It suggests that service-oriented architecture typically involved heavyweight inter-process communication protocols like JSON over HTTP. Uh, it'd be more like, I'd assume, message pack over IPC. Uh, or is that t- uh, taken to mean that all SOA requires SOAP? Uh, Will, Will Diesel, um, XML schema, and the full collection of WS da- dash specifications. Ironically, nothing about microservices in any way prevents it from using any of those heavyweight protocols, and some microservices are even suggesting the use of gRPC, a binary protocol that bears closer resemblance to IIOP from Cabra, Corba, which is a heavyweight protocol a predecessor to SOAP, WSDL, XML schema, and the full collection of w- uh, WS specifications. I think wh- one thing he's missing is I think it also is uh i think it's just standard like message pa- like because you can communicate just you know via linux uh just like a little little socket also so but i i see what he's mean but it's mostly going to be http let's just be real it's http pipes are just real-time linear microservice orchestration it really is it really it truly is they enable real-time processing real-time processing has actually been a thing for quite a while and while many such systems use a pub sub or event bus model to do it it hardly requires microservices to do it absolutely absolutely uh but you can i mean i think for me real-time event processing is a great one to kind of quote unquote microservice out or have its own thing that you listen to and use uh that seems like a great thing but you can add events like you can still have a monolith architecture and still have that at the same time right uh, they facilitate rapid growth. By the way, if you break the monoliths, like Siri did in The Witcher, that's how that's how those beasts come to be, you know? Uh, they facilitate rapid growth. Reuse the modular architecture. Do we even have a account? Oh, wait, no, that's not why. It was when the uh, the alignment happened. What am I saying? Uh, reuse the modular architecture. Uh, do we even have a count of how many different things uh, have all been, let's see, all promoted reuse as a selling point? Language certainly uh, have it or have done it. OOP languages, procedural languages, functional languages, uh, libraries, frameworks. And one day I want to see something hyped that explicitly says, screw reuse, we don't care about that. This man has not, this man has not seen HTMX. HTMX is this. HTMX is 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 truly this, right? Which is just like stop. <laughs> stop trying to make everything reuse. Okay? Make your API endpoints produce the same thing. They enable more outputs. Uh, data sets often are presented in different ways to different audiences. That sounds uh, a great deal like Crystal Reports homepage. Uh I like how they don't even try to debunk this one. They just or try to they're just like, yeah, well, what about that? This is pretty much how Twitter communicates. Oh, so you don't like React? Well, then why is why is Angular sucking then? You're like, I don't like Angular either. Good call. Uh, easier to assess updates in the application lifecycle. Uh, they need to... Uh, they need to access existing computation models against newly created models for machine learning and advanced analytics environments. It kind of sounds like a large pile of action words thrown together with little substance behind them. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> Uh, they enable scale. How, let's see, how funny. This, uh, the same was said of EJB, transactional middleware processing, a la Tuxedo and mainframes. Yeah, I don't think they enable scale like they're saying. Uh, many popular tools are available. I don't think I have to really work hard to point out that these tools have always been available for every major hype that's come through our industry, particularly after the hype was taken root for a while. Most readers won't even be old enough to remember case tools, but they may, uh, they may be, uh, oh my goodness, but maybe they'll remember UML. UML is the devil! Okay, I had to do so much UML. Do you, 
not even talking about. We're moving on. But uh, let's see. But the discerning reader will notice that there is plenty common theme about half the points above. The idea of, of creating and maintaining small independent chunks of code and data versioned apart from one another using common inputs and outputs to enable larger integration of systems. It's almost as if at the heart of microservices, uh, we find modules. Yep, the lowly, the lowly module, the core concept that has been at the heart of most programming languages since the 70s, even earlier, though, it was harder to do with older languages that didn't incorporate the module as a first-class core concept. Call them assemblies on the on the clear C sharp, F sharp, visual basic jars or packages on the JVM or dynamically linked libraries from your favorite operating system, doles from Windows, SOs or A's on uh, Nixes, and of course, Mac OS uh, has the frameworks tucked away inside the library directories. Uh, but at the conceptual level, they're all modules. Each has a different internal format, but each serves the same purpose, a, an independently built, managed, versioned, and deployed unit of code that can be reused. Consider this working definition of a module, quoted from one of the Computer Science Foundational papers. A well-defined segmentation of the pro... I can't read this word without thinking of the word fault. Of a project effort ensures system modularity. Each task forms a separate, distinct uh, program module. At implementation time, each module and its inputs and outputs are well-defined. There is no confusion in the intended interface with other system modules. At checkout time, the integrity of the module is tested independently. There are a few scheduling problems in synchronizing the completion of several tasks before checkout can begin. Finally, the system is maintained in modular fashion. System errors and deficiencies can be traced to specific system modules, thus limiting the scope of detailed error searching. This comes from Dave, uh, David Parnas, a, a seminal paper. The, on the criteria to be used in decomposing systems into modules, written in 1971, over 50 years ago at the time of the writing. Well-defined, separate, distinct program modules cover about half the suggested benefits of microservices. You know, this, I mean, this is a fairly compelling take, right? Like, I'm definitely, I definitely see the benefits of, of microservicing things out, and I definitely see that people can build some really terrible monoliths. I think one of the problems we see is a classic argument in our world, which is you point to something that is bad, right? We all agree that we've made bad monoliths. And you point to those bad monoliths and you say, see, this is what happens when you write monoliths. It's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily true. And so it ends up being this thing where you, 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 you paint one idea as just purely evil and then you paint a solution, right? It's like I forget what the I forget what the term is, but effectively it's like a gosh, what is it? This is a concept that happens all the time, right? Uh, but anyways, it's the same concept where you're just you're able to demonize something by just like some version of it. It's a straw man argument in some sense, but I know that there has to be a term for this where you effectively paint in the people's mind. Uh, a, it's like a form of propaganda that paints in a an idea and then you you give the solution to that idea that is different gaslighting you're completely wrong on this one gaslighting comes from the movie gaslight gaslighting if i'm not mistaken where a guy turns down his the lights in his house to drive his wife mad where she goes is it dark in here and he goes no and he's driving her crazy that's gaslighting is where where what's happening you deny reality to somebody else such that they consider themselves crazy. No one uses the term gaslighting, correct? You know why? Because a bunch of people are a bunch of idiots, and all they do is go on Twitter and see the word gaslighting happen, and then everyone uses it, and now they're all wrong, and now gaslighting means nothing. Gaslighting means you said something that pisses me off. Now it's broken. Now it's completely wrong. I'm not. I'm actually not gaslighting you. I'm, I'm giving you the. I'm giving you the deets. I'm giving you the tip and the shaft here. Okay. Gosh. Gaslighting isn't real. Are you crazy? <laughs> uh, same with the word literally. Literally, literally does not mean literally. Prime uh, is trying to gaslight us. Shut up! Thank you, Dax, for rating. I don't have alerts. Bangers are on and we're reading an article. Uh, it's about microservices. Because microservices were really never about microservices or services or even distributed systems. At the heart of microservices, we should find organizational clarity. I love this. I love that. This is true. Amazon, one of the first companies to openly discuss the microservice concept, really wasn't trying to push the architecture principle as much as they were trying to push the idea of independent development teams whose blockers were few and far between. Waiting on the DBA team for a schema changes, QA needs to build uh, to test so they can find the bugs, or are we waiting for infrastructure team to produce a server, or the UX team to create a prototype for the presentation? 
Slurp. I don't I I don't understand this, but okay, let's go. Is UML gaslighting? UML is actually gaslighting. UML presents you a lie of the world in which you believe is true, but actually the reality is that it's moved underneath it. Cherry picking might be the term. <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, that sound you hear is the development team aggregating ownership to, of any and all of those dependencies that could and frequently would block them from moving forward. Yes. So having a, having a defined and independent contract between teams in which can move out of underneath them is effectively what you're saying. Uh, it meant that the teams were small microcosms of the average IT team's various parts, analysis, development, design, testing, data management, deployment, and administration, and more. It did mean that now teams either had to be assembled from a variety of, des uh, of uh, desperate skill sets or else we have to require, let's see, despair, uh, dis 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 desperate, despair, dis oh my goodness, I, I know the word, but I cannot say it. Dis disparate, disparate. I always call it disparate. disparate. It's not, it's disparate. Dispar Oh my goodness, I cannot say this word. I know what word it is, but I can't say it! Or else we had to, uh, to require the complete set of skills in each team member, the so-called full-stack developer, which meant that hiring these folks would become in, uh, infinitely trickier. It also meant that now the team was responsible for its own production outage, meaning that the team itself has to be given an on-call responsibilities and the commiserate payroll and legal implications that go along with that. But we all, let's see, when all that was navigated, it meant that each team could build their artifact independently of one another, constrained by nothing other than time and the physics of how fast fingers can fly over a keyboard. Use Vim, by the way! So in theory, anyway, um, hold on, what did Judo say? It's worth mentioning that Amazon embraced this because their shop was an epic trash fire where everything broke all the time and teams didn't trust each other at all. It's literally a fortress of ment uh, mentality to protect your code. Yes, this is true. So I've heard this many, many times by many people, including uh, ex-managers at Amazon, that it is truly like it has the same air of Apple where like what you know is leverage for you to use against somebody else. I hear super effed up things. Yeah. I mean, we shouldn't get... I don't like this phrase, we should get rid of all people. <laughs> that sounds scary. Uh, but I think we should uh, try to nudge people, and I think people should fail on their own. It feels good to fail, you know what I mean? Invalid stack point in a string, uh, disparate. I know, I can't... I don't. I know what I'm trying to say. All in winter, thank you very much. Nope, 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 nope. Uh, yes, we'll be doing that in just one second. It's right there. At the heart of microservices, we often find the fallacies of distributed computing. For those not familiar with them, the fallacies were first coined by Peter Deutsch uh, in a presentation to his peers at Sun back in the 80s. They reappeared in 1994 seminal paper, A Note on Distributed Computing by Anne Walrath and Jim Waldo. And they both essentially say the same thing. Getting distributed systems right, performance, reliability, scalability, and whatever right means is hard. Loosely paraphrase. Uh, when we decompose the system into an in-memory modules running on a single operating system node, the cost of passing data across platforms or library boundaries was pretty uh, negligible. Even 50 years ago, when passing the data across network lines, though, as most microservices do, adds five to seven orders of magnitude greater latency to the communication. That makes sense. Uh, I, would, I would buy that instantaneously. I mean, because you're communicating, if you're communicating to a library, we're talking about microseconds, right? When you're communicating to your network card, your network card then has to communicate across the, the wire. The wire has to then get to the right place. The right place then has to have that network card reading the data. That network card then has to send an interrupt to your program. Your program then has to respond to it, copy the data into it, and then process it, then send the response back. Of course, that's going to be like a 10x increase, right? Of course. What are you talking about? Uh, every once in a while, some smart mofo comes up with a with a title like, hey, minor note on massive topic and casually attaches 1,500 pages of genius to it and shoves it all down our throats. Yep. Ac yeah. Academia, if it wasn't so awful, it would be great. But there are a few times it's fa fantastic. It's amazing that it only increases at 10x. Yeah, it is true. That's one beautiful part of close, fast, fast as light communication. Almost fast as life, right? Exactly. Exactly, Zioc. Um, All right, hold on. Yep, some can be, let's see, some of that can be made less relevant by hosting the microservices on the same machine, usually by loading them into a cluster of virtual machines running containerized images out of the independent microservices, as in using Docker Compose or Kubernetes on the host collection of Docker containers. Doing so, however, adds latency between the virtual machine process boundaries because we have to move data up and down the virtual network stack in accordance with the rules of the seven-layer model, even if some of those layers are being entirely emulated. Yep, I mean, it's true. No matter what, you have to add some amount, some non 
negligible amount of call uh, and still creates a reliability issue of running on a single node. Yep. The, what's worse, even as we start to wrestle with the fallacies of distributed computing, we begin to run into a related but separate uh, set of problems, the fallacies of enterprise computing. Oh, beautiful name. At the heart of microservices, we need to start rethinking what we really need. Do you need to decompose the problem into independent entities? Can you do that by embracing standalone processes hosted in a Docker container? Or can you do that by embracing standalone modules in an application server that obeys a standardized API convention or a variety of other op um, options? This is, okay, for me, this is where, this is where Git submodules always feel like the right choice. I always want them to be right. I literally fall prey to get modules constantly because the concept is always amazing the concept is so great on paper every time it just bothers me so much that i hate get some modules so much but on paper are they incredible they are incredible the idea is they, they judo they are they are horrible but yet, at the same time, it is such a good idea. Ugh. This isn't a technical problem that requires abandoning anything uh, that's already been built. It can be done using technologies from anywhere in the latest, uh, the last 20 years, uh, including serverlets, uh, ASP.NET, Ruby, Python, C++, and maybe even P uh, Perl. <laughs> the key is to establish that common architecture and backplane with well-understood integration and communication conventions, whatever you want or need it to be. Do you need to reduce the dependencies your development team is facing? Then begin by looking at those dependencies and working with partners to determine which of them you can bring into the team's wheelhouse. If the organization doesn't want to officially break up the skill-centric ontology of its org chart, meaning you have a database group, an infrastructure group, and a QA group as peers to your development group, then work with senior executives to at least allow for a dotted line reports, reporting structure. So there's individuals from each group that are now matrix uh, in on a single team. But, wow, that's just, I mean, now we're getting into the fancy speak. Uh, but most importantly, make sure that the team has a crystal clear vision of what it is they're trying to build. And they can uh, confidently describe the heart of their system, uh, service architecture module uh, to any random stranger walking on the street. The key is to give the team the direction and goal, the autonomy to accomplish it, and the cl clarion call to get it done. I mean, actually, I mean, I really do like this this last part, which is, when you do break everything into a microservice architecture, by that very wisdom of saying we want these separations, you also create a ton of ancillary problems, right? You will find yourself working continuously on a ton of just unrelated issues, right? You don't actually build your business logic, which could be very, very simple. Instead, you build like exceptionally complicated ways to make sure that all these play nicely, right? You really truly do have to build an entire an entire canary testing and like uh, an automated canary analysis for every single service that you release. You need to be able to do that. I forget what they call it, blue green or whatever type of uh, thing where you release one and then you can slowly change it over. All that. It's like it's really it's really non-trivial to also do it the other way. Uh, it really boils down to these two things, which really, really, really have nothing to do with each other except tangentially. Agreed. Still using Sway? I haven't started yet. Uh, love this article. This was fantastic. Honestly, this was a great article. Just kind of challenging a lot of the, the key points, I think, that we, that we have in our head. Whether or not it's actually true, it just challenges that point. And you should do this more often in your life. Always challenge yourself because you don't really realize what is and what isn't. You know what I mean? Like you don't actually know why you do the things you do. It's the known. Uh, it's the it's the unknown knowns. The 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 things you think are good. You may think they're good just because everyone around you, right? It's the hundred monkey experiment. You don't even realize you're an you're you're a monkey, right? The name is the primogen.